Express. Asian Pacific Expression. Community and cultural coverage. Music and calendar. New visions and voices. Coming to you with an Asian Pacific Islander point of view. It's time to get on board the Apex Express. Well, here we are tonight, this beautiful night in Berkeley, California. This is a jam-packed evening again here on the API show in Northern California. My name is G. Tonight we'll hear about the intensification of uh, the area as in, in Pakistan. And as you know, there's been more bombings that are happening there. So we're going to find out more a little bit about that. And May is also Asian Pacific Heritage Month. And with Asian Pacific Heritage Month, there's a lot of events, including what's happening at the Oakland Asian Cultural Center. They have one coming up this Saturday. And amid there is another performance that I think uh, we're going to be talking about in just a bit. It is a performance by a group from Afghanistan as well as from New York. So maybe just a little bit about that, and we're going to go right into that. Hello, Gina. We have the Exile Theatre from the Kabul, and they are going to present us some live music. We have the Rabab player here, who is the chief performer in this play, which is a mix of visuals, you know, storytelling, and live music. And he's, they have put together a mosaic. So we are listening a piece to it. Yeah, we're, lis- we're listening to a piece right now, and um, the piece that we're listening to is actually the Rebab player is sitting in the studio a little bit, and he wants us to play this a little bit. But we're going to have some live music as well, and this is from um, one of the performers from the Exile uh, Theater of uh, Kabul, and they are going to be performing with the Bond Street Theater of New York. The uh, Ex- uh, Exile Theater of Kabul um, takes stories. As a matter of fact, there are people here who have quite stories, quite a big stories to tell as well. So we're going to get to that in just a bit. Um, the Rabab is the national instrument of um, Afghanistan. And um, one of the things about the Exile Theater in their collaboration, which is happening this weekend with the Bond Street Theater from New York, is that they take um, very tragic stories, but they kind of elevate them in a way and manner in which people have hope and uh, feeling about what's gone on for the last 20 to 30 years in Afghanistan. So uh, we're going to hear more about how they use visuals, how they use personal stories and performances and music and blending that all together to bring to people uh, this wonderful performance that's happening this weekend as part of the San Francisco International Arts Festival. But first, just a little bit of music on the Rebab from Qureshi, who's also in the studio with us from his CD. Joanna, Michael, Qureshi, who's the Rabab player, and Jamil. Michael is on the drums, and Qureshi is playing the Rabab, at least in the sea. Joanna, let me ask you, um, what exactly is this performance about? Uh, This performance is a gathering of stories from our experiences. We went to Afghanistan right after September 11th, and we went into the highways and byways and spoke to people about their experiences over the last 30 years during the Russian invasion and during the Mujahideen civil wars and under the Taliban and got stories from men and women and children and uh, people of all different ages and walks of life, rural, urban. And uh, we took these stories and we 
videoed their telling their stories in their they're in their homes and and uh found ways, this was the challenge, to find ways to tell these stories, some of which are really horrific, in ways that would be interesting and watchable and uh, still maintain the essence of the story, but um, as uh, she put before, elevating them in a certain way so that they're uh, visually interesting and attractive and yet don't lose that impact. And uh, I think that we succeeded in finding some very interesting physical, visual musical ways to tell these stories. Now we were talking earlier and you told me this is a mosaic. So you have music going on in the background, you have actors and mm-hmm. then you have visuals including video and then there are some puppets as well. Uh, yeah. So. yeah, it's uh, some interesting shadow puppets and different lighting effects that uh, bring these things to life. A little bit of uh, a physical uh, acrobatics you could say and uh, I, I think people should come to see because it's, it's almost hard to describe, uh, but uh, yet at the same time it's very visually attractive and interesting, and it's it's historical so that you know it it follows the history from over this period of time. So it's laid out in such a way that people can follow exactly what's going on and what we're demonstrating. Now let's talk about the music a little bit, um, Qureshi. Yes. Yes, he's there. All right. Now, we were talking about the music earlier. So what kind of music uh, did you visualize? I know you said you incorporated a lot of classical pieces, but now this is a play which is being presented to the audience and there's a story being told. So can you talk a little bit about the music? Uh, yes. Uh, first of all, thank you for having us here. Oh, thank you. It's wonderful. Um, uh, yeah, the music uh, that I created for this play is uh, basically I'm using my um, raga's classical expertise uh, to create uh, music for different scenes here in this play. Now, to interrupt you just a little bit, so you are a classical musician per se? Uh, yes, okay. um, I'm, uh, I'm playing uh, classical as well as uh, folk pieces on uh, this uh, Afghan rubab, and I've tried my best, this is my mission to distinguish uh, the sound uh, of this instrument from other instruments uh, surrounding Afghanistan. It's very important to uh, keep the identity of Rubab. Right. Uh, but uh, let's get back to what I'm doing in this play. Mm-hmm. Uh, using those expertise of uh, uh, different ragas, I create this music uh, for happy moments, uh, for sad moments, uh, for aggressive moments. Uh, so it suits uh, very well with the play and um, uh, it creates uh, the environment uh, and supports the play while um, they're performing. Now, did you have anything in mind when you are, you know, was the storyline laid out before you? Um, before you decided to compose these pieces or put together these pieces or was it more as you saw the story unfolding in front of you that you improvised? Uh, yes, uh, there were a few things. First of all, I read the play and then I thank uh, Giovanna uh, Sherman. She's uh, the director of the play. Uh, she went through with, uh, uh, with the play with me. So we went through it. That helped a lot. And then after uh, uh, seeing the play, actually the play, mm-hmm. for a couple of time, uh, and then I was able to create all this music. Especially after we also had the same show in Japan. That was the first time that um, I played the music for this play. Uh, to be honest, uh, the first uh, performance, uh, it was a little bit different. Then after I went through the whole play from uh, beginning to the end, um, and then I was more comfortable and created the exact uh, piece for the display. Now um, uh, it uh, suits very well. I, I had a question for uh, Jamil because uh, he actually is from Afghanistan, Was um, uh, gone, went to the uh, University of Kabul there, um, was uh, an a- uh, it studied acting, originally was studying um, journalism. Uh, I don't know which is more dangerous, actually, to, to study. <laughs> you can translate for that, let, that later. But anyways, um, I, I just wanted to know from uh, Jamil, what was it like trying to study art and trying to be an actor? Was it, could you do a lot of performances in public, first under the Soviets and then under the, uh, the Talib, Taliban? مشکلات بود وقتی که این کار رو نیده می کنید خب 
په وقتی که ما در پانتون محصل بودیم یک گروپ از دوستا بودیم بسیار خوب کار میکردیم دوستا بسیار علاقه داشتن خب رفته رفته کارهای ما رنگ میگرفت و علاقه مندی به هنر تیاتر بیشتر شده میرفت یکی دو سال زمانه که ما در پانتون درس میخوندیم وضعیت آرام بود یک کدام تاریخ بود؟ کدام دوره بود؟ زمان نجیب روسا بود زمان بعد از ختم روسا زمان نجیب بود یا دس واز هیز گانا گو تو دیفن تایمز دیفن گورمنتس دا دی ور ان کابل این هیز گانا سی هاو واز ایت هی سید ایت واز فور کپل اف ایرز ایت واز ویری گود افتر دا روشن لیفت افغانستان دا واز دا بیس تایم اف ایس کریر until the uh, collapse of uh, communist government and the arrival of uh, mujahideen بعد از او یک وقتی که رژیم مجاهدین آمد به افغانستان خب اول باید ما بگیم که ما تقریبا 4 سال پانتون در مدت 12 سال خانیم به خاطر یک شرایط درست نبوده در بین تحصیل ما همیشه مهاجرت آمده And you also said, I should say this, that uh, usually it takes four years to complete the uh, university, but unfortunately I did it in ten years. And this And this is what happened uh, when Mujahideen came for two years, uh, uh, he fled to Iran because there were not much uh, artistic acti- activities. And then after two years he returned when he came back. Uh, when he returned, he went back to school for one year, and this was the time of uh, arrival of Taliban. So there was a stoppage in his uh, studying again, and then he fled to Pakistan this time. And this was the time, uh, the Taliban's time, as we all know. Uh, there was no room for any artistic activities. And this was the time uh, the Taliban ما با هم خواستیم که یک گروپ را ایجاد بکنیم که تیاتر افغانستان خواستیم دوباره زنده بسازیم در دیار مهاجرت and while uh, they fled uh, to Pakistan um, him and his uh, uh, friend uh, Mahmoud Salimi which is uh, uh, the director co-director of Exile uh, Theater uh, they created uh, the Exile Theater in Pakistan uh, to have the theater in Afghanistan alive again, have these activities started again in uh, Pakistan. Now, let's go back to the music a little bit. And uh, now this is the th- collaborative theater, and we have an American musician here, Michael. Um, he is on the drums with Qureshi. Now, how did this collaboration occur? What made you interested, you know, get, you know, how did you become interested in playing drums for a rabab? And how was it different? Uh, well, uh, first I'll make it clear that um, I wear many hats for Bond Street Theatre. I'm a longtime member of the company. And uh, this is a most recent hat of a percussionist. Um, I, uh, I think of myself mostly as an actor or at least a collaborating artist. And it's been a great pleasure to work with uh, Qureshi um, on this show. Um, I've had a lot of experience of doing sound effects for our theatrical productions, and uh, I think I'm, I've been accused of being able to keep a rhythm to a certain extent, which allows me to uh, improvise. So um, I'm certainly not the percussionist on the CD. I think uh, Qureshi would, could tell us who, who is the percussionist on the CD. Uh, that's Chetram Sani, uh, one of uh, Afghan's uh, uh, well-known drummer. 
Oh, yeah. okay. And I think he's playing tabla on that too, right? Yeah, it's tabla and dol. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, so th this has uh, been uh, 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 once we, it kind of evolved my playing more percussion with uh, within the show. First, it was with uh, the sound effects uh, that people could see uh, with uh, bird calls and uh, water sounds and uh, accents to the action on the stage. So, was there a lot of training involved in terms of what Qureshi wanted from you um, and how you, you know, modified your own playing? Not really, but I think a lot of the techniques that we've had to use in Bond Street Theater, um, where we've gone into so many different, you know, countries. We've been about 30 countries throughout Europe and South America wow. and uh, Asia. Um, you, Learning to uh, collaborate on very different artistic levels is one of the things we're most fascinated with. And uh, I think the collaboration language is one we're using a lot. So training, I, I think it'll be pretty obvious that I haven't had specific uh, classical training by any means. But we do a lot of rhythmical exercises within our company, not just with music, but with uh, with using our bodies. We're, we're going to hear music from you guys, right, in, in the studio in a bit, but uh, I did, I did want to go back and ask, after the Exile Theater was established in uh, Kabul, I, I, I guess, um, what was it like being, uh, I guess it wasn't <laughs> established in Kabul, it was established in Pakistan. That's correct. Mm -hmm. And um, what was it like being exiles in Pakistan and trying to do theater, I mean, what, what was that? What was that like? I know that's a big question, but maybe the the main thing was it was it fun? Was it? تجربه تان چی بود وقتی که اکسالتی در پاکستان ایجاد کردین؟ در اوج خوش بودین، سخت بود، مشکلات داشتین، چطور بود؟ در باره کمی صحبت کنیم. دلیل ازی که دوباره ما خواستم اکسالتی را خواستم در پشاور پاکستان پای ریزی بکنه می بود که خواستم تیاتر افغانستان یک دوباره زنده شده و چون ما تحصیل کرده یا می رشته هستیم نخواستیم که مسلک ما پشوری ما جان بکنه با او خطر محمود چای سلیمی با یک تیدات از هنرمنده سینما و تیاتر راژی تلویزیون افغانستان پای ریزی کردن من تا مشکلات زیاد بود ما سپورت کننده نداشتیم و که سپورت بکنند تیاتر اگزایل تیاتر خود ما کار میکردیم کار شخصی از پول شخصی خود بروزای مختلف ملی یا ایت واز کاند اف دیفیکلت ات دی بیگینینگ بیکاز دی ور سپورتینگ دیم سلف دی هاد تو ورک دین دی دی این وات ایور ارنینگ دی دی هاف دی ور سپیندینگ on their activities, artistic activities. Uh, he also mentioned uh, Mahmoud Shah Salimi's name again, that he found uh, with his friend, founded this exile theater. And um, f for that time, it was a little bit difficult. <laughs> مراجع مختلف به خاطر نمایش دادن تیاتر و بعد از او باز یک سلسله مشکلات از طرف پلیس پاکستان وضع شد که ایام یک صد رای شد برای فعالیت های بعدی ما در پاکستان چی مشکلات پلیس بتا خب همی که شما کی هستین چی میخواین چرا ای کارا را میکنین چرا نمایش میتین yeah, uh, and then uh, slowly, uh, so, uh, while they were established and they had uh, uh, people come in to see their plays, uh, their difficulty started with the Pakistani police because uh, they don't want them to freely uh, do whatever they wanted to do. Uh, there were some uh, restrictions um, on them. What is the problem? یک بود که مامدشای سلیمی به کمپ ریفوجی افغانا با باند سریت ملاقات کردن که وادای همکاری بعدی بین جانبان گرفته شد و بعد از اینکه ما در سال 2002 دوباره به افغانستان رفتیم در سال 2003 اولین محصول مشترک ما به امراه باند سریت and then uh, yeah this was it was in, in 2001 um, they met uh, Bond Street of uh, New York 
and they started to collaborate uh, and do work together. And um, you know something? This music sounds so great that um, I, I was wondering if you guys wouldn't mind playing a, a live piece for us um, in the studio. Now, Michael is on the drums and Kureshi is on Rebab. And instead of listening to your CD, Kureshi, we're going to go straight to music. Is that okay? That's fine. That's fine. Except uh, um, I always say this. Uh, to say, I think it's important to say the instrument is very sensitive uh, with the... Uh, the temperature it has a skin here as you can see and every five or ten minutes uh, the, I have a difficult time with it in San Francisco oh, okay. uh, especially today because uh, um, we were doing a, an open air uh, concert in mm -hmm. Union Square oh, wow. and so the sun was directly on us so it affected uh, the instruments but uh, we'll try our best okay thank you <laughs> so we're going to get going here this is Apex Express right here on KPFA and KPFB in Berkeley KFCF in Fresno You guys sound wonderful, man. I couldn't tell that there was like some kind of like, you know, sun kind of cold problem, dampness, blah, blah, blah. It sounded good. It sounded Thank very you. good, guys. Yeah, it sounds great. Don't worry about it. Um, by the way, before we, we have to start wrapping it up, actually, unfortunately, I just wanted to mention that you guys are going to be performing this weekend. And Beyond the Mirror is going to be Friday and Saturday, the 29th, 30th, and the 31st, which is Sunday, at the Carl Street Theater, Fort Mason Center, San Francisco. And for tickets and information, you can go to www.sfiaf.org. Again, sfiaf.org, which is San Francisco. International Arts Festival org. Um, before we we transition out, I, I wanted to ask you. Um, there are so many stories uh, that have, have happened over the last God thirty, forty years, almost forty years. Joanna, uh, what story? What are one? What is one of the stories that that's, that people may may see when they when they come to the theater? Just a real brief synopsis. Uh, uh, Anissa, uh, Michael's saying that I should tell Anissa's story, but I think Anissa's story is very interesting. I was going to mention the story of a uh, the bicycle rider delivering his goods. And this is a very common situation that bike, bicycle deliveries going across Kabul, going across the highways and byways during the during the wars, 
and what the difficulties that they met along the way. And I think the way that we interpret the scene is very interesting because it could be really nasty and it's really very, very interesting. And uh, I just like the roadblocks and such. with the roadblocks and checkpoints and things that happen at these checkpoints along the way. And I think the way that we interpreted the scene is really uh, quite interesting and um, it's kind of a favorite of mine. So you mentioned that um, there there's a lot of tragedy actually in in what the play and in people's lives but uh, how how do you transform that without you know exploiting people's stories uh I, I wouldn't say, it, uh, you know, even think of the word exploiting. It's really uh, taking their stories so that there's, um, you know, I think our, our whole purpose was really to de demystify the experience of living in war and uh, make it real and, and uh, bring, it, bring it home to people so that there's a, a sympathy and an understanding of, you know, what life is, is like and to, to see the humanity because... Wherever you go in the world, people are alike, and everyone has the same wants and needs and wishes and hopes. And, you know, everyone wants to be able to just get up in the morning and have a nice day and live their life in peace and harmony and send their children to, to school or to, you know, have a nice breakfast and just to live life. And I think that we want to show, all in all, humanity and how much we share and... uh through that, see the hope in the situation, the hope that we as human beings can pull together and really, as we reflect each other, and, and how much we reflect each other is really it. I, I just want to say thank you to you guys for coming. you got a very, very busy schedule uh, coming out from New York, uh, Kabul, and Pakistan maybe. <laughs> that, that's our next show. We're going to be talking about what's going on in Pakistan, a real tragedy right now happening unfolding um but again uh beyond the mirror is the name of the performance which is a collaboration between the exile theater of kabul and uh the bond street theater of new york again for more information uh you can go to triple w s i a f dot o r g san francisco international arts festival so again thank you so much joanna Qureshi, michael and jamil for being on apex express right here on kpfa and kpfb in berkeley kfcf in fresno thank you thank, thank you very you. much for having thank us for really having enjoyed us. it sure. okay thank you and we're going to go out with a little bit of Qureshi cd of upcoming events in the Bay Area for the week ending June 7th. All events are wheelchair accessible. Please listen closely for contact members. On Sunday, June 7th at 2.30 p.m., the African Diaspora Film and Discussion Society will host a screening and discussion of The Greatest Silence, a film exploring the routine use of rape as a weapon in the war in the Congo. This event takes place at the Cerrito Theater, 170 San Pablo Avenue in El Cerrito. Admission is $7.00. For details, call 510-665-7880. On Saturday, June 6th, from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m., the San Francisco Youth EcoFest will host an environmental summit and green block party at the Civic Center Plaza, 355 McAllister Street in San Francisco. For more information, call Global Exchange at 415-255-7296, extension 209. On Saturday, June 6th, from 1 to 5 p.m., the 18th Annual Bear Fest will be held at the Wells Fargo Center for the Arts in Santa Rosa to benefit the Sonoma County AIDS Network. There will be Northern California microbrews, food, and music. For more information, call 707-544-1581. The community calendar is produced by members of the First Voice Apprenticeship Program. Send your listings at least three weeks in advance to KPFA, Box 51, 1929 Martin Luther King Jr. Way in Berkeley, California, 94704. Fax them at 510-848-3812 or email us at calendar at kpfa.org. Attention to the community calendar. Tell us if your event is wheelchair accessible. 
To hear this calendar again, call 510-848-6767, extension 621. This calendar is also online at kpfa.org. And a little bit more about different calendar events, events happening because there's so much happening during Asian and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. Uh, I do want to say that uh, the Oakland Asian Cultural Center has a fairly major event coming up this Saturday, which is in right in Oakland, Chinatown. Very convenient to get to right by the downtown street BART station. If you are in the Easter Bay, San Francisco Bay area, you are listening to some music by one of the performers who is uh, going to be there. His name is Jay Loyola, and he is um, uh, a dancer performer. He has done many uh, dance pieces in the Philippines, Asia, and Europe. He is originally from the Philippines, and his dance methods have been very much influenced by many of the indigenous people of the Philippines. Um, this particular piece that's playing behind me is called Remembering the Palawan Busiador. And the Busiador are known to get nest from the remote caves in the Palawan Islands in the Philippines. And there is a tremendous risk to the collectors as well as the birds the collectors who stand on bamboo scaffolding. Um, there are sometimes um, centuries, very, very old scaffolding and very, very high, sometimes hundreds of feet tall. And over the past years, the demand and the price of these nests have increased the deaths of these collectors in their harvest. And this particular piece is in memory of their courage and their love for their families. And uh, Jay, you'll, you'll low up performs Remembering Palawan Busiador and this particular piece we're going to be playing just a little bit for you again is um, from his piece that's going to be performed this weekend on Saturday, May the 30th at the Oakland Asian Cultural Center also there there's going to be um, some Korean drumming, incredible Korean drumming which is um, often very polyrhythmic if you haven't heard it, this is a great chance to check it out because uh, Kyung Gil On who is um, one of once was a principal dancer for the National Dance Company of Korea is performing at the Oakland Asian Cultural Center Saturday. She is in charge of the Ong Dance Company, which uses traditional Korean drum and dance. And the music she's going to play is inspired by the sound of nature. And the dancers will move the drums as they play. Now, if you like this kind of music, um, there's going to be more of it because there's also going to be um, China Spirit Music Ensemble, music and dance from the um, Sayar Indian Folk Dance from Gujarat, as well as FX Down, which is a um, LGP dance company. And, uh, you know, one more thing, folks. Uh, also, Saturday the 30th, also at the Oakland Asian Cultural Center from 12 to 1 p.m., there's going to be child's activities such as Cambodian theater masks, Korean kites, uh, dragon mobiles of Vietnam, learning how to make all these things, as well as Japanese paper dolls. So all these things are happening at the Oakland Asian Cultural Center. The 12 to 1 children's activities is free, and the later dances of Asia following right after that with uh, Jay Yo, uh, Loyola um, is, is uh, again at the Oakland Asian Cultural Center Saturday, May the 30th. Uh, you can go to this address, www.oacc.cc. Again, that's oacc.cc. And this is Apex Express on KPFA and KPFB in Berkeley, KFCF in Fresno, and online at www.kpfa.org. The time is 7.33. We're going to be right back with you uh, with uh, an interview about what's going on in Pakistan now and the unfolding tragedy. So stay tuned. We'll be right back with you in just a bit. This is G and we are Apex Express. Apex Express. My name is G. 
If you want to get in touch with us, you can do so by going to this number, 510-848-6767, extension 464. That's 510-848-6767, extension 464. Or our email is apex at kpfa.org. That's apex at kpfa.org. And next up, we have Shamila Mir, who worked in Islamabad, Pakistan, for UNICEF. She has an MA in Pacific International Affairs, concentrating on international development. She later organized two programs related to the War on Terror for the Asia Society and uh, now works as a consultant for the World Bank. She has family in Pakistan and speaks the languages there, one of which is Urdu. She is also a good family friend of journalist Hamid Mir, who we couldn't get on the air tonight, but uh, Miss Mir, Shamila Mir, bought Hamid Mir to speak uh, to at UC Berkeley to share some insights that few Western journalists have access to. And today there has been another uh, bombing in a major Pakistani city with the Taliban threatening to uh, continue the bombing and has threatened to say it's um, evacuation time for people there and the U.S. continues to bomb uh, that area of Pakistan. So there is so much happening. Uh, so I want to say, Shamila, thanks so much for taking uh, some time out to come on Apex Express and talk about the situation there. Hi. Hi how, how are you, you doing? Yeah. So I think I have to ask you first off um, if you've heard from your family and, and how are they doing over there? Um, yes. I spoke to my father this morning, um, D.C. time, and I guess for them it was evening time. And, you know, I think this has been happening so much in the country that I think that they are somewhat... Ah, uh, you know, they just kind of get brushed off and say that, ah, uh, yeah, this is happening, but you know, our life is going on normally, and and you know, um, nothing has happened to us yet. Um, but definitely, I think the fact that the Taliban is moving closer and closer to the major cities. Um, well, yesterday's uh, two days ago, the bombing was in Lahore, and then today was in Peshawar. So I think, and my father lives in um, Islamabad, so I think they're definitely sensing more and more of an urgency for the, you know. The, for the government to deal with this issue as soon as possible. Um, but so far, everybody that I know is okay. Um, I've spoken to some of my friends in Lahore, and unfortunately, uh, fortunately that none of them, you know, have been hurt, um, and they're okay. But definitely it's a very frightening uh, situation to be in, especially when you can hear the bomb blast and actually being able to see the smoke coming out of building in, you know, major city center. Mm-hmm. So... I, I wanted to ask you, you were um, uh, responsible for, for, and it was a great talk of, that Hamir uh, Mir gave at UC Berkeley earlier this year, and, you know, he he was still kind of a controversial, he is kind of a controversial figure, he's a very well-known journalist in, in, in Pakistan, but uh, in the United States, you know, he was kind of, you know, controversial simply because he interviewed Osama bin Laden, Right. and um, I talked with you a little bit after his, his talk at UC Berkeley, and... and um, said that uh, you said that you felt that it's important that people hear what he has to say and I was just wondering uh, why what prompted you to to actually take the initiative and bring him out here um, one of the major reasons is that he is um, one of the major um, very popular journalists in Pakistan, and he has a very popular show on one of the major news, a private news channel called Geo TV, where he basically puts a lot of the politi- politicians or religious leaders on hot seat and basically grill them with very controversial topics, and you know, make them answer uh, something that, that you couldn't even imagine, you know, having those people. Um, answer to. So that's one of the things. He's known to be a very good investigative journalist, and also he has a lot of support um, from um, the general Pakistani public. Um, for example, he is not, his, his strong, his strength is not the English, you know, reporting, but it's the Urdu reporting, and that's pretty much the majority of what the Pakistanis listen to. And, you know, he also, I think, represents the opinion of the majority of the Pakistani. So I feel like rather than listening to sort of the Western educated journalists, I think I thought it was important for the Westerners to listen to someone who is a local and who has a pretty big support from the general public. And I think I I just thought that it was very important for the Westerners to listen to that opinion as well. Having said that, 
I don't have all the factual information to, to, to be able to tell you what he says is in fact true or not, but it just one it just it's just a different opinion that I think that people need to listen to. Hey Shamila, this is Ajis co-host Mip. Now, uh, you know, some you are someone whose roots are in Pakistan, and as you see the situation unfold day by day and getting worse, mm-hmm. what's your gut feeling? Uh, you know, my gut feeling is that. Um, I'm, I would like to say that I'm still hopeful about this, um, just because I, my father is from a middle class Pakistani family. He's not necessarily from the Western educated family. And they all practice religion and they're all, you know, they all consider themselves Muslim, but they're, they're by no means radicals. And I think that is still the majority of, of the country. And I think what you saw during um, the, the lawyers' protest against, you know, I mean, to, to basically give the support to the SAC judge, the Supreme Court judge, it was really the public sentiment that led to, um, you know, the President Zardari changing his mind on what to do with him. And so I would like to believe that I think the public still has that power, um, which I have not seen in Pakistan as long as I can remember. This is really the first time that I can tell or I can, I can tell you that the public opinion have, was, you know, was able to change the opinion of, of the leader. Mm-hmm. Um, having said that though, um, we also have not seen this many suicide bombings in the major cities of Pakistan, um, Islamabad, Lahore, Karachi. So that's worrisome as well. But at the same time, um, I mean, I, I am still hopeful, and yeah, I'm, I'm still definitely hopeful. I mean, I, I, I think I have to kind of stay hopeful because I have my whole, you know, Pakistani side of my family is all there, and right. I have many younger cousins, and I would like, I feel like I have to stay hopeful so that, you know, that I can see that the, my cousins are going to do great back in Pakistan and have a you know, good future there. Now, one of, one of the militant leaders today, they issued a warning, and they told the general populace of Islamabad, Lahore, Karachi and Peshawar to evacuate the cities and uh, you know they said more bombings will happen and we'll take revenge uh-huh. um, given that you have you know an extended family back there have you spoken uh-huh. to any of them about all this and how seriously they're taking this um, I've spoken to them and I, I still feel like they're not that serious about it um, I, I guess because they've been having this kind of threats for so long um, it's been a while since this has started so I mean, I still feel like they're okay. I mean, I spoke to my father this morning. He seemed to be, you know, in good spirit. And, and he's in Islamabad? He's in Islamabad. Okay. Yeah, I think you mentioned that also, but in the cities, I can I can almost see that. But but in areas like the countryside, like the Northwest Frontier Province, mm-hmm. where the bombings are occurring, where right. the conflict is occurring, the U.S. is continuing to bomb. Now, how do people really reconcile the fact that the U.S. continues to bomb and that, you know, I mean, it's hard to support a situation where the U.S. is bombing and, you know, if it happened to the U.S. here, you reverse that, this place would be in an uproar, like after 9-11. So what, how are people reconciling the U.S. bombing and then there's attacks from more, you know, the fundamentalist militant side? Um, I really, I really don't know exactly what how people are reconciling this situation at the moment. I mean, I, I mean, oh my God, I couldn't, I, well, there, there's no fear that uh, the military will come back into power in Pakistan. Though. Well, I think that's one of the major concerns for the, the Pakistani government, um, as always it has been. Um, I mean, currently, um, the, the military is sort of staying on the sideline, um, but basically, you know, trying to take care of the situation in SWAT, uh, but basically, you know, working under the command of of the government and hopefully that that will stay that way but the problem is that if the government is not able to finish this job very well then they will be another um sort of um you know that that's how the military government has come in to Pakistan in the past as well that the public basically ceased to support the current you know democratically elected government and they seek so much stability that they end up supporting 
the military government, and that's how it has happened in the past as well, and that's how Musharraf came into power, and I have to admit that I voted for his referendum because things were so unstable in the country that, you know, Musharraf came in with this, this vision of stability and growth, and we were all just, you know, wanted some system. And so that's, that's another thing that I, I guess that mm-hmm. could potentially happen. Well, well, another question I did have is that um, you were talking, mentioning about the organi- organizing of, of lawyers in, in um, Pakistan mm-hmm. for more democracy and to let go of some of the jailed, uh, I believe, uh, lawyers and judges in Pakistan. Mm-hmm. And you had mentioned that you had never seen that kind of drive towards democracy, at least when you were when you were there. And right. um, but but do you think that that kind of movement for democracy can be sustained given the circumstances or if it, if it is sustained how how can that occur I think it's very difficult at this moment because precisely what you said as well, you know, the U.S. drone continuing to attack uh, these tribal areas and even the military is attacking. And, you know, I mean, right now the situation is a little bit different because, well, those people are basically have those people are leaving the SWAT region, you know, to the cities. Um, so they they may not necessarily be in direct um, under a direct fire of the military attacks that is happening in those regions. Um, um, but at the same time, I think the drone attacks. I mean, I think there's still a huge debate about whether the drone attacks are helping at all, um, and even the military attack is helping at all if it's dragging regular civilians, um, you know. Um, into into this whole military action, so that's a difficult. Um, I think that's that's just very difficult to assess. But I think one of the major thing now is that there's about 2.4 million people who are internally displaced, and I think I uh, I think that the you know the UNHCR is also running out of money and supporting those people, so. I think that's another danger um, that's been created. You know, basically they were trying to to fix the problem in, in the tribal area and SWAT by conducting a military attack to basically defeat those Taliban. But then now you have 2.4 million people who are displaced who, you know, does not necessarily have the basic necessities. They're in a refugee camp now. And if you can't really take care of those people, what will happen to those people? And I feel like that can become another big problem for the Pakistani government because if you don't take care of them, it can, again, you know, the government can sort of be seen as being failing to support 2.4 million people, um, the refugees. Now, on the topic of refugees as such, are, you know, if you have spoken to your family, are these people very visible as they pour down from Sawat Valley and um, other provinces within the conflict areas? Are these people very visible? Are, are they you know, displaced that badly, that resources are not available, that they're coming to residents of bigger cities where they're going and asking for help? I think they are. And what I was told this morning by my father was that basically, you know, these people are from... Um, very cold climate, um, and right now in Pakistan, the summer is extremely hot, yes. and you know they're living in tents, and basically there are many, many. I mean, I, 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 I totally, I, I don't remember how many pregnant women there were, but I think even just today, there were many births that occur at the refugee camp. So I'd imagine that the situation at the refugee camp is less from less, you know, less than satisfactory, and I think that is another reason why I think the UN is making a lot of, um, um, you know, um, requests to to donate, and I think even uh, the pre- uh, you know Secretary Clinton has set up this um, way to sort of donate money to the US, US, uh, uh, UNHCR through texting. So, I mean, from that, from that itself, it seems like the situation is quite dire. One of the things I wanted to ask you, Ashimila, this is Jenna again. I, I needed to um, get from you this, the, your opinion about this. I, I know that you have a great concern about the way the West views Pakistan, and that was one of the reasons why you brought out um, journalist Hamid Mir. You were also, I think, uh, president of the Pakistani American Students uh, Association when you were in college. And... Um, what is your concern and and about you know being Pakistani American and do you feel it is going to be a backlash or I know that you have these you do want people to be more educated about what's going on so where can we get these resources though um, I think it's very difficult because 
even me sitting here in the U.S. right now, I mean, if I just turn on the news and even reading the New York Times, I mean, just by reading those, if I didn't speak to my family back home, I would be extremely alarmed by what is going on in Pakistan. So I think it's very, very difficult unless you're extremely interested in the region to actually fish out for different types of information because most of the information that is available is, you know, I mean, from obviously definitely in a different scale, but I think it does portray an image that the Pakistan is basically, you know, um, about to collapse. Um, so I think it's very, very difficult to, to get that message across. And I think, but not just from the side of the Westerners, I think um, obviously the Pakistani, the Pakistani government is not doing a very good job of um, appealing to, you know, globally to show themselves as being, you know, um, responsible um, citizens of the world or, you know, that they're not as radical as people might say that they are. I mean, there obviously there's definitely some kind of disconnect between the two areas. Um, because some of the information, because when, when I'm in, when I'm in Pakistan and when I see the news, I don't feel so bad about the things that's happening over there. Um, you know, I was there in June and I came, I left, I mean, granted that the things have sort of deteriorated since then, um, I definitely came back from Pakistan with much more, um, um, positive view of it than when I, you know, right before I, uh, I, you know, right before I left to go to Pakistan. So I don't know what can be done to, to fix this problem. But definitely I think during when, you know, when um, when the government decided to sign this peace deal with the with the, the clerics or the Taliban in, in, in um, Swat Valley, I mean, the immediate thing was, I mean, there was just so many news flash about Pakistan, nuclear power. I mean, they're just... It's, I think the images were so, you know, it, 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 I think I, we were all bombarded with those images before having any sort of analysis of why they signed this peace agreement. So there's that sort of, sort of sensationalism in media, I think, is definitely not helping, especially when you don't know anything about the region. You see these images, and that is exactly what stays in your mind. Now, uh, you know, we have to wrap this up. We are coming to the end of time. But very quickly, you know, I have to ask this question. Over the past couple of years, there has been an economic boom in Pakistan. Of course, the last year or so since the recession hit, mm-hmm. um, you know, it has kind of not come to a halt, but it's slowed down. Mm-hmm. Now, do you think all this conflict is, is affecting the investment and the job opportunities that people have? Oh, I'm sure it has. And I think even the economy was developing. I don't think it was trickling down at all to the to the poorer uh, segment of the society. And I think this is precisely the reason why we, one of the reasons why we have this problem right now, that it is very easy for the Taliban to recruit these poor people because the government is not providing them with any basic needs. So I think that even though the economy is growing, it was definitely not going down to the people that it should have gone to. Um, and yeah, certainly I think in future, um, this is, you know, I don't think anybody would want to invest in Pakistan at this point when all of this is happening. So I think in future as well, I think this is going to greatly affect the, um, the economy mm-hmm. of the country. You mentioned that uh, Hamid Mir has a, a TV, he's on TV. Is that is that uh, also in English, and can we link that? If we want to know more information about what's going on in Pakistan, aside from the media here, is, can mm-hmm. you make any suggestions? Um, I think um, his TV shows are all in Urdu, um, but there is definitely a couple of websites that um, I can um, I can either email to you, so you can post it on your um, on your website. Mm-hmm. Um, but there are definitely some um, because there are so many news channels and also newspapers that are written in English as well, um, and I think those give a pretty good overall view of what is going on in Pakistan. And you know, it, they they represent different mm-hmm. views as well. So, by the way, uh, just for you, uh, Shamila, thank you very much, and for the audience out there. This is Apex Express's uh, number, which is triple, well, actually, it's apex at kpfa.org. Again, apex at kpfa.org. Shamila Mir, thank you so much for being on Apex Express, for taking this time out. And again, um, we hope all is well with you and your family and Hamid Mir. I know he goes on very dangerous assignments. So thank you so much for being on the show with us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shamila. Thank you.
And this is Apex Express right here in Berkeley, California. And we are also coming out of Fresno on KFCF. And um, I just want to make a few more announcements because uh, there's so much happening. Ethnotech, if you like slam bang story jams, it's story jam, meaning a gathering of story-based artists, poetry, uh, stand-up comedy, performing arts. That is happening May the 29th at 8 p.m. through May the 30th at, um, again, 8 p.m. And on uh, May the 31st, music and storytelling, the return of the nobody. Now, the Nobodies, man, they combine all kinds of music. They combine music, uh, rock, jazz, traditional. It has, I believe, Mike Sasaki on guitar, who used to be with Cold Blood. I think he's still with the group. But anyways, uh, Robert Kikochi Ngoho, who plays a multitude of instruments. Jason Jong playing percussion. And Ethnotech themselves are a multi-pan-Asian cultural performance group. Ethnotech, um, if you want to know more information, you can go to this website, which is www.ethnotech. And I'll spell that E-T-H-N-O-H-T-E-C dot O-R-G. Ethnotech for for slam bank storytelling and the nobodies coming up this weekend. Also, the Indo Pacific Edge. Brother Clay uh, has a Pan Asian and Indigenous Peoples uh, special coming up here on KPFA. That's Pacific Time, 6:30 to 10 p.m. Sunday, May the 31st, for the Indo Pacific Edge as uh, part of um, the um, Asian Pacific Heritage Month. Also, uh, the wonderful uh, Malcolm X. Jazz Festival. The Malcolm X Jazz Festival is happening this Saturday. It's put on by Eastside Arts Alliance and features the wonderful uh, David Murray out from New York, or Paris rather, Howard Wiley and the Freedom Now Band, plus so much more. Malcolm X uh, International. Well, it's not international, but Malcolm X is, is the, the Jazz Arts Festival. It's happening right here in Oakland, California. Also, I am going to be playing a little bit of music from Surya Dub, Surya Dub, and um, this is music by uh, Kush Aurora and Manish the Twister. It is off of Kush Aurora CD. And as we are listening to this music, we are going to give away a pair of tickets, a pair of tickets to those of you who like a mixture of electronica, dub, and so much more. Um, Surya Dub, they are having an event at Club 6, at Club 6. So if... Um, you want to go to it. We have some tickets to give away. That uh, event uh, is happening, I believe, this Saturday. Uh, you can go to their website, however, if you're interested and uh, find out more, which is www.going.com, Surya Dub, which is happening May 30th. So May 30th at Club 6, which is uh, near Market Street in San Francisco. Club 6 is 60. 6th Street from 9.30 p.m. to 3 o'clock a.m. Again, Surya Dub featuring Manish the Twister, Crush Aurora, and Mala of Digital Mystique this Saturday, the 30th. So we're going to play a little bit of cut for this, and we are going to give away a pair of tickets. A pair of tickets as we listen to this music as we go out. So thank you for listening to Apex Express and do stay tuned for the Bonnie Simmons Show. By the way, the phone number here at KPFA is 510-848-4425, 510-848-4425. If you want a pair of tickets to see Surya Dub this Saturday at Club 6. And you are listening to some music that's going to be happening there that night.